I would like to. We're being recorded. <laughs> Just in, case, in case anyone was curious, that's now happening. Uh, honest, please go. So I will actually try to explain um, how I can transition from uh, CTC to VC as a service, okay? I'll talk about that portion of it. Um, so Jim actually mentioned that CTC's goal is, uh, one is to basically have, be an innovative corporation in some sense. So CTCs are looking to invest in startups so that they can have a relationship with them. They can learn from them. Uh, they can also help them at the same time because they have experience of running large business so that they can help the startups you know, grow their business as well. But main goal of CVC is to do that, is to have a relationship with the startup and grow. And as Jim mentioned, I think there are a few ways that you know, corporations are investing and they're calling it a CVC. They're investing mainly from their balance sheet, uh, which also comes with a lot of risk, by the way. Uh, it directly affects your balance sheet. Uh, that's a not a good practice or that is not a practice I recommend normally. So a lot of corporations are also building their fund and, and they're managing it through their employees. And uh, while they're doing that, the problem they're facing also, some of the corporate employees, um, they are not born to be a, a VC, right? So they are put in that job and being asked that, you know, talk with the startups, uh, collaborate with them, make an investment, have a relationship with them. Um, so that becomes very complicated for, for them as well. So in some sense, you know, um, the corporate employees are asked in a CVC to actually have a single individual fund, which is sitting as a, as a part of the corporation, and they're asked to actually invest from that. That is what, what the form of CVC we have seen uh, traditionally uh, around the world. And I know that some of the large corporations like say Google or Intel or Cisco, all of their corporate arms, and they work as part of the company. So what uh, we're talking about today also is also another item is a VC as a service. And I will quickly um, share a slide to actually um, show the boundary. So the left side is what we're calling about uh, CVC that uh, Jim and I are discussing, right? That part of the corporation, you can see that within the corporation, uh, one, an employee or a few employees or a hired expert is running a CVC fund and really starting investing in different startups, obviously, at this point, we know the areas of investment and everything else. While as the VC as a service, what we are doing, we're kicking out that venture capital or CVC uh, activities outside of the corporation. You see they're done different colors. It is outside of the corporation. So it is a third party managing your fund and helping you with your, uh, with your investment activities. In the VC as a service model, uh, it is run by a third party, normally an expert. Like I personally manage a lot of VC as a service funds and we are outside experts with a bigger network. And also the other benefit that, you know, the customers are getting through this model is that they get to meet other uh, corporations also who are also uh, using a third party run the, their fund. Uh, through this model, actually they have better access, more access, um, and they also have an expert running the farm. They're also able to take care of some of the portfolios for collaboration and also post you know, investment, they're able to take care of these investments um, by taking care of by some professionals, which is the third party fund manager that you have hired as a VC as a service model. So that's kind of like the basic difference between these two models. We are seeing uh, continuously that a lot of corporations are coming out of their CVC traditional model of balance sheet investment or making a fund under their corporation to giving the whole responsibility to a third party like us to manage their fund and, and have them manage it and take care of it and is still being supported for running innovations within the corporation. I like that slide, by the way. Um, can we de-share that, Honest, just for a second? Sure. Thank you, my friend. Uh, so one thing that I wanted to, uh, to get into was a little bit about the, the, the thing that Jim has mentioned earlier, which is what CVCs as a broad category of investors are looking for and, and the balance between financial returns and strategic returns. Because one thing that I, I know whenever it comes up that I'm talking to a CVC is I'm curious, what's the balance between the two? Which are they kind of weighting more heavily? Are they more focused on money, more focused on strategy? And, and Jim, I'm curious, you know, because you talk to a, a lot of these groups, is that ratio changing over time? Are they focusing more on finance or more on strategy in the last couple of years? It really does vary uh, quite a bit from company to company. Um, you have some CVCs that are very focused on 
um, furthering the strategic goals of the entity. But I have seen an increasing trend toward focusing on financial returns, particularly for those CVCs that have established a separate fund. Uh, and that's driven by a number of reasons, both the need to show returns, uh, the incentives internally uh, within uh, the CVC fund. So many funds have, are switching slowly to more of a carry type model that you have sure. within VCs that reward performance. And uh, that tends to um, obviously cause the professionals that are in that CVC fund to focus more on financial performance as well since their compensation is tied to it. So still a good variety, but definitely a trend toward um, emphasizing uh, financial performance, particularly in for entities that have established their own funds. And then honest over to you with, with the many funds that you guys manage, have you seen a similar shift in, um, in focus amongst your corporate partners? Are they looking for a different thing than they were a couple of years ago, or has it been relatively static in, uh, in your experience? So from our experience, actually, it is very similar to what Jim, Jim just mentioned. Um, so most of the funds, I think when it comes to a corporate fund, you know, um, they used to be like only technical goals, right? With mm -hmm. collaboration goals that I will work with the startup. I will learn from the startup. I will also try to collaborate with, take the technology functionalities embed into our product and technology and can still be competitive in the you know, public company sector. Um, that was the goal, but we're seeing more and more of those corporations now raising their voice that we also want to make sure that we're making some, you know, return. Um, actually, a lot of our Japanese clients, and we have about 20 plus corporations uh, as our clients today, uh, they're mentioning that uh, make sure my principal is protected <laughs> at the least. They do I mean, know this know. is venture capital, right? This is not... <laughs> FDIC insured savings accounts. Yeah, okay. you're right. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is no FDIC insurance for the money. <laughs> yeah. So yes, we're seeing more and more of that. As you mentioned, so we're seeing a trend where people are getting careful. Also, like if you think about it, a, a set of employees of the corporation is involved with the CPC operation. At the end of the day, whenever there is a rotation in most of the corporation, and after three years, new people come back, uh, they will forget uh, what the motto of that fund was. They will say that, oh my God, this fund has lost all its money and it is a failure. So there is also that thing of transition in culture every three years is something that most of the corporations have to deal with. And that's where, you know, um, uh, you know the financial return can become very important uh, for the people that who are living and some people are taking over. Okay, so keeping uh, our, our theme to the evolution of, of corporate venture capital as a broad umbrella that encompasses everything that we've mentioned so far, uh, I've been curious to see how expectations have changed. Because one thing that I learned early on when I was covering venture capital is that a corporate investor might be a board observer, for example, as opposed to being kind of a full cloth board member. Uh, but it seems listening to you guys talk that corporate venture capitalists are not just increasingly savvy, but a bit more engaged than they maybe were five or 10 years ago. So uh, Jim, is that changing the expectations expectations for board seats and other kind of traditional venture um, items uh, from the corporate venture capital perspective and what people demand? It is, you know, as, v as CVCs increasingly lead investments, they led almost 40% uh, yeah. of investments in this past year, according to, to some sources. Um, and, you know, their expectations are changing as well. You mentioned, you know, 10 years ago, you used to see uh, CVCs largely taking uh, board observer roles. Uh, now you see an increasing mix uh, looking to board seats as well. And there's a number of considerations at play there. And you know, when you do take a board seat, that director now has fiduciary duties to the portfolio company, but you want right. to balance that against the increasing voting rights and information rights and access that you get as a director. So definitely seeing a trend in, in that direction. And also just generally with, with terms, you know, most of the terms you're going to see from a CVC versus a VC, the primary financing documents are going to be very similar. They're going to look uh, very much the same. And so the main difference is going to come in some of the, the special terms that the CVC may ask for. And that's going to vary from uh, CVC to CVC, um, dependent on what their purpose is, what their goal was. Uh, but they will have some terms that they really uh, do focus on, things like inform information rights. Many CVCs are public companies, and they want or need access to information regardless of what uh, the financing documents say. Uh, they'll have concerns about public announcements. Uh, confidentiality. Um, they want to control that message, that story. Um, even as they become more like financial investors, they still want control over uh, what is being said about their involvement, maybe not broadcasting that to competitors. Um, 
and I think competitors is still a key area. Um, notwithstanding that you've had some changes in, in purpose, you know, CBC still care a lot about if competitors even allowed into the company, either as investors, acquirers, commercial transactions, there often may be some term, special terms around that that you wouldn't normally have with a VC investor. And then I, I think last is uh, acquisition rights. Um, and, and that's a key one. And, and Alex, you may have seen this from some of your discussions with, with companies too, in terms of um, uh, CBC is looking for special rights around the acquisition uh, of the company, either a right to notice, negotiation, or even an option to buy uh, the company. And that's going to be more important the more strategic the investment is versus just a purely financial investment. Okay, so it's interesting to hear um, Honest talk about people wanting to protect their principal and you discussing uh, terms being similar to what they were a long time ago, but with board seats and so forth. You know, Honest, is there a too high of an expectation from some corporations about what they can get out of a corporate venture capital fund? Um, because it is, it is risky. You don't get full control. And, you know, at least theoretically, startups should be agile uh, without having to worry about a, a large public perhaps company. Um, so are, is there too much demand from the corporate side or are their expectations still in keeping with what the modern startup uh, is willing to put up with? Um, I think, you know, um, it is understandable their demands are, right? I mean, um, some of the corporations, especially if you're looking at corporations um, in the Western world, like in the US and Europe, um, they definitely want a little bit more control of the startups. They are treating it as like they're investing as a, you know, private VC. Um, so they keep it at that. Most of the hires of these corporations are also from the regular VC community. Um, so they, they tend to have that mindset. Whereas if you are looking at some of the Asian uh, counterpart there, I mean, they are looking at more informational rights. And the reason is being that as a uh, public corporation, they also have some you know, uh, responsibility to the market that they need to disclose these and right. that information. So uh, that's where I think the informational right part that Jim just mentioned come from, that they also have the obligation to disclose it to the, to, to the uh, public market and, and to the government, to the you know, uh, market itself. So that's where it comes from. I think um, if we stand in between and actually help them out, you know, manage that expectation that what is possible and what is not possible, that's what I do quite a bit. The cultural gap is just amazing. I mean, like yeah. uh, their expectation is here and this expectation is here. And I see that I deal with a lot of foreign clients there. And one of our job is to actually bridge that gap. And that's where we help a, a client from Taiwan or a client from Indonesia to come to the US and partner with a startup uh, in Silicon Valley where the expectation has a big gap. Uh, and we try to bridge that and, and minimize that gap. Um, we also actually, we also have that practice as Jeb mentioned, in, in most cases, we'll try to have an informational light at the least so that the information can flow. Uh, if we are investing a significant amount, obviously we have the right to be, be a board member. Sometimes we, as a VC as a service model, we run the board. Sometimes you also open it up to our clients, but in most cases, our clients want us to run the board because they think that we are better fit to be able to help the startups in some sense and they have the, all the information flowing through us so that they can also collaborate and work with them at the same time. Does that make the terms a little bit um, more difficult to come to because the, the, the company that's providing the capital isn't actually taking the board seat or is that a relatively easy arrangement that doesn't require undue amounts of paperwork and confusion? Actually it is, uh, we're doing it on a day in day out basis today. I mean, like they are very used to it. Sometimes they, they really want to work very closely with the startups in that case. And sure. they have a lot of subject matter expertise from the corporations part. So we actually recommend that you should be on the board because you can help them more. At yeah. the end of the day, I think we educate our you know, corporate clients at the same time that you are becoming a board member of a startup because you need to help them. It is not to control them, right? Yeah, right. The, the concept is different here. <laughs> so I think, you know, from control to help, I think is, is the new word that we actually try to educate them with. And that's our job as also the fund managers to make sure that our clients know what they're getting into. Right. It's, it's a lot of money. I mean, having expectations is perfectly reasonable, but given how much traditional venture capital there now is, you know, Jim, I mean, there's, there's so much money in the private markets today. It's, it's almost bonkers. 
if terms get onerous, it's going to be hard to get into a deal. Um, but I'm curious because you and I both sit in the uh, venture and corporate venture world. We know that the traditional venture capital world has had a crazy couple of quarters, just super active deal making, fast velocity, high valuations, and competitive um, terms. Is that showing up as well in the corporate venture capital world, Jim? Or is it as competitive and heated as the uh, sequoias of the world? Definitely. I mean, uh, you know, the CVCs are competing with the VCs for those investments. And so some of these special rights that they want, they're going to temper their expectations if it's a really hot deal in a really hot space. So, Got it. you know, Alex, just as you mentioned, it's been really active here over the last few quarters, particularly in the life science side, for example. Mm. So if you're trying to get in the next hot oncology drug and there's four other VCs at the table and you're going to be a follow-on investor, not leading the round, you're not going to walk away with significant M and A rights, for example. You're you're going to have to temper those expectations about what you're going to get and what special rights you're going to get. And so it's it's really going to vary um, based on the um, how hot the market is, and it's it's been pretty hot in a lot of areas right now. So you, you're going to have to make sure that what you're asking for, uh, the package that you're that you're giving, and maybe you're going to give more on the valuation side to get some of these other rights, uh, is attractive to those startups. Okay, that that makes sense to me. And then. Uh, honest, kind of the same question over to you. Uh, has there been uh, the ability amongst uh, kind of the Pegasus uh, LP companies, partners, if you will, uh, to be able to move fast enough to make deals happen? Because I, I keep hearing from founders that, you know, this deal came together in a week, these deal came together in a week and a half. It seems like there's never been less time to get into a deal uh, and get to a yes. Is that possible with your, with your model? So actually, this is actually a funny uh, thing to tell you that is, one of the reasons why they do VC as a service is to be faster in the decision-making process. So they take one approval through all their board meeting and stuff, it takes three months maybe, and then they take a chunk out of $50 million. They actually come and tell us that, hey, run this VC fund mm -hmm. for our, on our behalf and let's create some protocols so that we can actually involve the right people to get a timely decision out at the right time. So I'm sure that, you know, for making an investment, we have to go back to them and ask them that, hey, you guys feel comfortable about this deal. We're going to make a $25 million deal. And that's what we did last year. Um, we we're making an investment in a media company. We ended up investing $35 million and $25 million was coming from a corporation. Mm -hmm. And we could complete the whole deal within uh, 10 days yeah. from the beginning till end because it was a hot deal. You know, Google and Facebook and Alibaba, everybody was investing together with us. So we had to make that happen. So how did you do it? We had an approval on the whole chunk already by the board. And now we have a fund and then you can invest from the fund. So CVC creation actually helps you with that process. Then you do not need to go back every single time. And that is the balance sheet investing that we originally discussed. That That is the difference between a balance sheet investment and making an investment, making a fund especially if it is managed by a third party VC as a service, then you have full freedom. You just have a quick chat with your counterpart and see like who are the persons you need to talk to. You can come up with a scheme as well. For example, for most of the funds that you manage, you also come up with a scheme that for how much money investment, who I should talk to and make sure that they feel comfortable with it. You also create a scheme within the each funds and do it that way. And that's how we can do speed control. If you're looking at investing in top heart startups, like say Y Combinator startups, like this is hot, right? I mean, those deals are out in one week after they present within a week, you have nothing left, everything is gone. So, but our, our partners, like all of our Japanese corporations and there are 20 plus of them from Japan, they are investing in Y Combinator startups every single year. And how they're doing it, they have created a special scheme for Y Combinator ah. so that, you know, within 24 to 72 hours, they can come back with a decision to us. And we are still able to make investments side by side with Sequoia and Google of the world and being competitive. And that is the power of brand and why startups still go to Y Combinator. Um, <laughs> honest, I want to I want to stick with you for a second because um, this morning I was actually, I was podcasting and I noticed that uh, Salesforce Ventures, a, a, a well, I, I would say one of the better known corporate venture capital groups in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley, uh, had made a deal into an Indian startup. I forget the name of it now, of course, because we're live. So of course it's left my head. Uh, but I was a little surprised to see an American CBC lead a deal in an Indian software company, India based, it's based in Bangalore. And because um, to me, it's always been a little bit geographically uh, 
constrained. And so I'm curious, are you seeing um, more CVC uh, investments go cross border than we might have um, 10 years ago, say? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at, uh, if you're comparing 10 years ago and what is happening now, I mean, most of the CVCs are very global. Uh, indeed, um, uh, I actually make now 50 to 60% of my investment is still in the US, um, you know, mainly in, you know, Silicon Valley and the East Coast uh, because of the Boston region. And then half of my investments are happening in Tokyo, um, in, in Southeast Asia, countries like in Indonesia, Vietnam, where all the supply chain is moving, right? right. And also we are making some investment even in India, as you mentioned. We literally made an investment in India in, in one of the you know, gaming company called MPL. Um, and it was a pretty popular company as well. Um, so we, most of the CVCs, they're looking at collaboration, right? And collaboration come from two different areas. Obviously they're looking for top technologies and top technologies are coming from not only the US company, but many of the Israeli companies, for example, sure. many of the German companies. And we're investing a lot in Israel and German as well. Um, and many of the top consumer related products and technologies are coming from Southeast Asia. We have made 40 investment in Southeast Asia in the last five years. So it is becoming global and CVCs are interested in expanding their horizon. It also, by the way, as a VC and as a fund manager, it helps us with the risk balance because you're not dependent on a single region to actually make our overall return and make our overall success a story. No, that helps. Jim, uh, a similar topic over to you about uh, what you're seeing from your clients. Um, this ability to look outside the uh, country that uh, a company might be in is, is, is cool. But I mean, we both recall back in the day when people wouldn't invest outside of like Mountain View in Silicon Valley. So I I'm kind of curious, have corporations been as quick to raise their gaze and look into different regions as, as traditional VCs or are they following uh, the other VCs that we know? Yeah, I think they are. It, it depends, really it varies. Um, we're seeing it both in terms of expanding domestically, just as you mentioned, not just looking in the Bay Area, but across the US and then globally as well, you know, particularly Japan and India. Uh, we work yep. with a lot of uh, um, Japanese CVCs as well um, that are really looking globally. And when you have a global company, I think you tend to look more global in terms of your investments because if you're following that strategic direction of your company and your company is now doing business uh, significantly here and there and over here, um, your investments are gonna follow because you're trying to stay on the cutting edge of that technology and really expand um, right. Uh, your R&D and collaboration uh, as well. So, uh, you know, I, we've seen some CVCs are on the forefront of that. We've seen others that are sort of following the trend, but in general, the overall trend, just as Anish mentioned, and you mentioned as well, is this expansion globally in terms of where the investments are located and where they're coming from as well. Okay, I want to stick with you, Jim, because uh, we've had a couple of questions come in from the audience and just skimming them, they mostly appear to be from founders. So I want to bring up a question that I wasn't sure we were going to get to, but um, we've all seen a, a change in how startups are funded, especially at the early stage. We've gone from all price equity rounds to capped notes, safes, all sorts of um, innovative mechanics for getting capital into companies quickly. And uh, people would even say fairly. Are, are CVCs hip to all of that? And are they willing in your perspective to, to go along with the prevailing uh, financing methods or do they prefer a more traditional, uh, I don't know, price to seed round, for example? I would say that we've seen CVCs move earlier and earlier in the ecosystem. So whereas five, seven years ago, you may have seen CVCs really investing in later stage companies that are already uh, further along. They've come much further along in terms of doing seed investing. A lot of the investing does still follow the more traditional kind of seed investments, but uh, you are seeing them participate as well in current financing vehicles, whether that's safes, convertible notes, sure. um, otherwise, uh, they, they definitely have moved uh, in there. Some have got there quicker than others. Um, and uh, again, there's a variance still in terms of what stage those investors are looking at, but overall the trend has been to move earlier and to participate, you know, not as much as VC investors, but increasingly so in some of those, in whatever the prevailing instruments are uh, of the time and here as safe convertible notes, certainly. That was a brilliant segue to what I wanted to bring up next. So thank you for that. That was ideal. Um, 
honest, I, I was thinking a lot about what you guys run. And whenever we've talked, you've mentioned $35 million funds, $50 million funds. So sizable amounts of money, but certainly not uh, an Andreessen Horowitz $1 billion behemoth. And so I, I'm curious about the mix of, of, of investing stages that you see and what portion of things that go through the Pegasus model end up uh, being seed versus say series A or series B and, and how that's changed in the last couple of years. Because I, I'm curious if there's been a, um, a focus shift among corporate clients in terms of what they're interested in and how early? Most of the corporations, if you, if I take a data of 10 years, for the last okay. 10 years, I mean, as you're doing the VCS service model, uh, where the corporations are investing through us. So we get to hear what they want to do, want us to do in some sense for them. Um, so most of them are interested in, in advanced round companies. I will say series A plus, let's okay. put it that way. So they're looking at series B as the main because they want to make sure that as many of my clients are coming from outside of the country, right? They're sitting in Japan or China or Taiwan or other countries. I mean, they're also looking at, you know, working with the startups and giving them a global expansion experience. So that's what their main goal, right? That they want to work with the startups and help them expand their horizon into big Asian market because two thirds of the world population is living in Asia, right? So, that's what they're looking at. So when they're trying to do that, as you can guess, I mean, most cases it will work out for them if the, if the product and technology has already seen some light in the US market, right? In the local market or in, in the Israeli market if they are as an Israeli company. So we are seeing a lot of interest on the later rounds. However, uh, people are also realizing that it is becoming so difficult to get into the competitive deals at Series B. So uh. we are encouraging them that why don't you get into some of the deals at a very early stage? And that's where my last comment came in, why Combinator, right? right. Take the stars. Some of the top incubators are becoming their targets that they would like to meet those seed round companies who are going to become the next unicorn. And, and, and don't get me wrong, but we have been able to invest in some top companies in the quantum computing area, for example, and they all came from Y Combinator. Uh, for example, Rigetti, one of the biggest quantum computing companies yeah. uh, in the world, comes from Y Combinator and I was one of the seed investors. Uh, so same way, like some of the top seed round companies are becoming the next unicorns. And you know, if I'm an investor at the seed round, it helps me get access to the same company at series A, series B, when my client is ready to you know, bring them to Japan and do a bigger expansion in the Asia. So that's what is happening right now. It's fascinating to have this conversation because I feel like we could almost swap out CVC in some context for just VC and these trends would hold up because a lot of the stuff we're seeing on one side of the fence appears to be leaking over, you know, funds going earlier, fighting for allocation at series B. Um, thematically, this is very similar to what I hear from, from um, non-corporate uh, venture capital players. Uh, in my mind, for some reason, I still have like Intel Capital in my head is like what a CVC is. But in reality, that that's outmoded. Intel Capital is still a great firm, don't get me wrong, but like it, it, much scrappier shooting earlier. I mean, it, it, the stuff that I'm seeing elsewhere really does seem to apply here on us. And I, I, maybe I shouldn't be so surprised by that, but I didn't think we'd end up this close to... Um, conversations that I have about, about other things. Um, but uh, Jim, quickly, um, fund formation. I know that Honest has a bunch of, uh, of companies that have come to him to help build funds, but I'm curious from your perspective, are we seeing more companies put together uh, new investing vehicles than we did previously? Are companies kind of getting into the VC um, boom that we've seen in the last couple of years? Definitely, and it's across industries too. It's not just the traditional uh, types of companies that you think of in terms of technology or, or life science companies, although there certainly are uh, quite a few of them, but almost every industry that you can think of, companies in that space are forming. And I think according to CBI Insights, there's been over 1,400 new CVCs that have entered the market in the last five years. So this yeah. is across size of the company, across technologies, across industries, and, and like we've said, geographies. So um, really you're seeing more players come in. One thing that's been interesting too is, is with obviously the, some of the disturbances in the economy this past year, you know, traditionally back, if you look back in 2008, the worry was CVCs would be the first one to the door. Um, anytime yes. that there was some economic uncertainty, um, they'd pull back, pull the funds back and stop investing. That hasn't happened right now. You're seeing a good continued activity uh, in 2020, they participated, I think, in 25% of the deals. And those deals made up 50% of the value, too. So they would participate in big deals as well. So um, we've seen continued investment in, again, 
coming from across a wide range of industries. So again, a beautiful segue into uh, the COVID topic. Um, honest, we're sadly still inside uh, the COVID era. I haven't left my house really in a year and looks like six more months of being a hobbit. But uh, I'm curious what impact um, COVID had on your business and if there was any stress amongst kind of the, the Pegasus customer base about um, kind of just conserving cash during a pandemic and a recession and frankly, just a multi-quarter period of uncertainty. How did that impact on your business? Well, luckily enough, uh, we have not been impacted that much. Obviously, we still miss, you know, working under the same roof. But um, other than that, I mean, in terms of like um, our growth has not stopped and we have not seen any of our corporations have, are coming to us and asking us that, hey, slow down. Uh, yeah. We do, should not spend any money. So they have never told us to be conservative. Actually, um, we are receiving the yearly report from some of our um, corporate partners and they're complaining us that we did not do enough investment last year. Uh, and I had to explain to and remind them that last year was a year full of COVID situation. Uh, so, I mean, they're a little bit impatient and they're asking us to double our number of investments in 2021. And I think 2021 will be a glorious year for sure with all the vaccines in play. Um, but, you know, we have not slowed down and our corporations have not asked us to slow down. So that's the great news. We have seen minimum impact uh, of COVID into the venture capital industry, at least uh, on the corporate venture capital industry part of it, for sure. Um, has some of the investors are conservative? I think, yes, some of the inv investors are conservative at this point. They are watching out and they are being careful. They're cautious more, for sure. But I will say that most part, uh, people keeping things as normal as possible. Okay. I mean, the funniest story of 2020 was how in March, everyone was terrified that venture capital was done for two years. And then by you know early May, everyone was writing more checks than ever before. I'm still trying to figure out precisely what happened in that eight week period, but it's, it's crazy to watch in real time. But I, I guess I'm not too surprised, honest, that people did come back around and wanted to keep spending. Um, on the 2021 point, are you going to be able to deploy that much more capital this year than, uh, than last year? Um, I am hopeful that 2021 will be a better year for sure. Uh, I want to see more activities. You know, I want to see more startups coming up. Um, the SPAC movement has, uh, you know, um, triggered the fire. I mean, how can you, you know, um, avoid that? So we are looking at every single SPAC. Actually, some of our companies are going to go through IPO this year through the SPAC process. Um, so some of our investors are also um, very hopeful that, you know, um, they will also be able to be part of that. And that is normal. I think that expectation is normal. And it is our job as Silicon Valley based investors to make sure that our corporate clients can also enjoy that you know, trend that you're seeing in the market. But with the SPAC in play, there are 243 SPAC IPOs in 2020 during the COVID. And it is gonna be, a, a, it is gonna be much bigger this year. That's what my expectation would be. And I want to be part of that. This is why the, the bags under my eyes have gotten progressively larger in the last year because someone added SPACs into my workload and I'm still rather cross about it. Um, Jim, a little bit off topic for the corporate VC versus VC world, but I'm curious while we're on the topic, um, amongst your relatively diverse client base, what's the appetite uh, for SPACs in general? Is it uh, voracious or is it more muted? There's a lot of interest. Um, okay. You know, it, it's capital and it's a great way for some companies to explore going public, to access capital, not only in the transaction itself and through hype investment that usually happens contemporaneously with it, um, but to get public in a, in a different, different mechanism. And there's so many SPACs out there right now and so much capital floating around that needs to get deployed just based on the timeline of how SPACs work, um, that there's certainly a lot of interest. So we were just discussing with a, a life science company the other day, you know, different options for their next financing, whether that was gonna be a private round a SPAC or a traditional IPO. And that conversation is happening with nearly all companies at a certain size. So, you know, different companies are taking different approaches to it, but there's a lot of interest in something that nearly every company that's um, of a certain advanced uh, stage is, is taking a really hard look at. Okay, now uh, it's uh, 42 minutes into our, our hour together. So if you are with us, uh, we have a number of questions that have come in, but this is a great time to drop your question over into the Q&A function on Zoom because uh, we're going to get to those in just a couple of minutes. I have a couple more quick ones, and then we're going to turn the baton over to the audience. So please feel free to drop in your hottest, best, most interesting, well-spelled, and non-profane question, and we might get to it here in just a couple of minutes. Um, 
honest, just a couple of, of short ones. Uh, price sensitivity uh, seems to have gone out the window amongst many VCs that are on the non-corporate side. Uh, I'm curious about um, your customers and your clients and your, and your investing base. Are, are they similarly not concerned about what's happened to early stage prices uh, just for the founders out there who might be curious about um, that impact? Um, actually, we are. Uh, and we advise them on the pricing and, and stuff. And we are um, looking at the valuations of each companies uh, very precisely, and we are comparing it against uh, all similar companies. And we're also giving our clients the right advice in some sense. Um, I feel that uh, during COVID, we have, uh, because you know, uh, most of the startups also got a little concerned that you know, fundraising is going to be very difficult. And yeah. it became indeed difficult for some of them, I'm sure. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of uh, down rounds as well. Um, I, a bunch of startups are doing down rounds. A bunch of startups are doing a bridge round so that they can come out of this pandemic and they can do a reg regular round. So we are seeing some good opportunistic investment as well uh, as a VC. Uh, so we're seeing that as well. Uh, pricing is a definitely a good concern. So I'm sure that if there are startup uh, founders who are also attending this seminar, I would advise that price it well, price it in a way that you know you can raise the capital faster uh, rather than in missing the moment. Uh, not any time is a bad time for fundraising. In, people are investing, people are investing in the right company and for the to be a right company you should have the right valuation for sure. Right, but going back to our Y Combinator conversation, I'm trying to square the two, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, uh, Jem, so one last question for you before we go to the audience side of this. Uh, I'm very curious about, um, corporate venture capital as a, as a portion of the broader venture capital market. Because on one hand, American corporations are incredibly cash rich to pick mm -hmm. one segment of the world. And so they have probably more resources than ever to devote to investing activity, which I'm sure Honest is really glad to know because he liked to manage all of it. Uh, but at the same time, the traditional venture capital world is also incredibly cash rich. And so I'm curious, do you see in the next couple of years, the corporate venture capital world taking a larger share of the, the private investing market, or will it remain maybe static uh, given that everyone is just so wealthy today? Well, I think whenever there's a lot of capital out there, there's gonna be competition for those deals. I do think you've seen an increasing trend over the last five to seven years in terms of the percentage uh, that CVCs have played. And I think that will continue to increase. It may not increase at the same rate, but it'll keep going upward. You know, with the way that many companies have, have really trimmed their R&D internally, you know, this is really the way that they're doing. They've shifted to an external R&D model, particularly in the life science field. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you're going to continue to see that increase because they've got the cash and they don't have the same set of resources internally that they might have had 15, 20 years ago in terms of developing that next generation technology. So the additional capital that's out there will you know, uh, keep it at a relatively similar level, but I think you'll continue to see an increase going forward. It's going to be very interesting to come back together at some point in time when the stock market isn't doing this and instead is doing that and uh, see how this conversation breaks down. But I promise everyone is with us that we could take some of their questions. Uh, and thank you, everyone. We have 23. We're going to get to about three of them. So thank you all for writing in. We'll do our best. Um, first up, guys, from Emily um, Morais, I think. She says, how do you expect the change in the White House to impact corporate venture capital and venture capital activity in the coming year? And I don't have an opinion on this. So I'm curious, uh, either one of you, what impact might the change in administration have on, uh, on your business? So I will quickly add, Jim, um, my comment on this one. I am hearing that, and I hope it does not happen, that there will be a, an increased capital gain tax rate. Uh, that's what I'm hearing. And I hope that is not the case because this will discourage innovation. Uh, in many countries that we invest in, capital gain is tax-free actually. Uh, so that people are encouraged to invest in startups. People are encouraged to um, you know, foster um, innovation and people are encouraged to uh, you know, in investing in startups as a sector of investments, right? Because there are many vehicles um, through what you can invest and a startup is one of them. Um, I'm hearing that you know capital gain is going to get get increased. I hope that does not happen. It is at 20% now. I hope that is that remains the rate for the moment. I also hope that corporate tax rate does not increase. Um, we enjoyed the 20% around 20% tax rate uh, for the last few years. I hope that remains st stable as well because that that impacts our 
bottom lines at the end of the day. And that impacts the overall innovation ecosystem as well. So I, I hope Alex, you'll write a lot about that so that it is not increased. <laughs> I don't think you would like anything that I wrote about that, Anas, given that I am taxed far higher on my labor than I am on my capital gains, which to me, given that one is work and one isn't, drives me bonkers. Uh, but my own politics aside, Jim, over to you, same point. Uh, new administration, how do you feel? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there'll be a mixture. You know, there'll be some, as with any change, there's going to be some factors that increase, some factors that decrease. So, you know, increased uh, immigration may help drive some more of the innovation economy, that there, there's been some um, challenges on that front from some of the technology companies that are looking to bring in more talent from overseas that have run into roadblocks that might, um, those roadblocks might lessen. Um, I think that you'll see certain industries really benefit from the change in administration, whether that's clean tech or other areas that will be more of a strategic focus for the current administration than the last yeah. administration. And then there'll be some tailwinds as well. So it'll be a, a mixture, but overall, I'm, I'm, I think there'll be some, some strong positives. Okay, just because we don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna throw some more in here. Um, from the well-named anonymous attendee, uh, here's the question. Uh, based on your experience in life science drug development companies, do you see better pre-money valuations and size of investment for SPACs or traditional IPOs? And I grabbed this question only because we did get to SPACs, so I feel obliged to grab one from the audience. So, uh, Jim, probably one for you. Yeah. Happy to answer that. So I think one of the main advantages that SPACs have is price certainty. Um, so setting aside kind of the question of, of valuation and where you're getting a better valuation right now to address here in a second, it's price certainty. So with a SPAC, you're really negotiating with one party up front in coming to an agreement on the valuation as opposed to with a traditional IPO where you're going through the full process, not knowing precisely where that's gonna price until the actual IPO itself or very close in time uh, to it. Uh, in terms of valuation, um, it really, uh, with so much money sitting in SPACs right now, there's gonna be a lot of competition, particularly in early 2021, because those SPACs have a certain timeline. And so they need to get those investments done and they need to deploy that capital. Otherwise they have to return it to their investors. And so that's gonna put some pressure on valuations when working with SPACs as well in, in a good way for many companies. Sure, and then honest over to you, any comments on that one? Um, so as Jim mentioned, I think if you're trying to um, secure a, an exit in the short term, SPAC is the answer. And once you are part of the SPAC and you're in the public market, you can grow your valuation from there. Uh, that's the best way to go. We're seeing a lot of cash, I would say, good revenue company who are having a good revenue and evaluation of, I would say, one to $2 billion. They are actually choosing the SPAC round because mm -hmm. SPAC is giving them an easy three to five to $6 billion IPO um, rather than waiting for the real IPO. Whereas you mentioned, you, the decision is going to rely on a lot of different factors. Um, whereas the spec is kind of like a one person call in some sense. So yes, if your size is there that I just mentioned, then most probably spec is a good answer. The spec will give you certainty. Your valuation will be not as big as you will expect in the IPO, regular IPO. Got it. Uh, so trade-offs there. Um, so uh, we have a question from Yuriko Izihara and uh, they ask, what impact will a capital gains raise in the U.S. have on venture capital and corporate venture capital activity? And honest, I'm bringing this up because I'm just curious uh, your read on this. Let's say capital gains tax went to 25% in, in America, just to pick a number. Um, how, how much would that dampen investment into startups? So I think, you know, um, for the corporate clients who are not really looking into making money or making a capital gain, rather they're uh, valuing the relationship with the startups and uh, collaborating with the startups and having more uh, collaborative advantage out of it, uh, they will not care. Uh, but it will discourage the venture capital, capital community itself where it will be very difficult for them to operate something and still uh, exist as a business, as a venture capital business. So. Um, and also it will discourage a lot of angel investors and other type of investors who are also investing for capital gain. Um, so corporate investors will not be impacted that much. Their capital gain will decrease because of the higher tax rate, mm -hmm. but it will not stop the activity at all in some sense. But I think the ecosystem is gonna get hurt in a big way. I'm gonna mark that down as a honest is in favor of a capital gains tax increase. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. Jim, Jim, I'm curious about your perspective. Is, is honest being too optimistic, too pessimistic? What's your read? No, I think he's, you know, he's 
hit a couple, a number of key points here because there are going to be impacts throughout the ecosystem if that change happens um, at, at each level, from angels to VCs to sure. the CVCs, and it, again on CVCs in particular and, and corporate investors, um, it, that's going to vary depending on that strategic focus, how much of it's financially driven versus how much of it is um, uh, versus how much of it is strategic. Um, but the, if there are changes in the number of opportunities available or just the trend lines in the industries. And historically, CVCs have sort of followed along in terms of the trend lines of the VC industry. So when it's hot, it's hot, and it's not, it's not. And if that starts to decrease a little, that may have an impact as well, though probably less than it did historically in terms of dips. Okay, uh, I'm gonna save this uh, Pegasus question for honest for a second. That'll be our last one. Um, second to last, uh, Jim, why don't you take this one? Um, this is from, uh, Krishna Swami, uh, they ask, do you see more investments going into AI startups, particularly in the B2B space in 2021 and behind uh, and beyond? So uh, amongst the people that you work with, is uh, B2B AI particularly hot? And then do you think it's going to see uh, a gain this year? Yeah, so AI in general has been a focus, not only of VCs, but particularly corporate investors uh, as well, as every company has kind of recognized that uh, there are aspects of AI they need to incorporate into their business or, or thinking of incorporating, many aren't sure exactly how they wanna do that um, or how they go about doing it. And so I do think that this is an area where we've seen many CVCs really focus on um, AI generally and then uh, B2B in, as well, in terms of looking at how do I explore this space and making investments is one area they've uh, found to help them gather that information, develop that ecosystem and evaluate how they wanna approach it. So I do think there's gonna be a continued strength in that sector. Yeah, that's my read. So honest, just quickly from you, um, are you seeing similar demand for uh, AI startups in general and perhaps in the B2B space? AI, you know, demand is continuing. I think, you know, we have invested in a bunch of them. Um, and I think we're still seeing the demand for AI startups, um, especially, you know, uh, with some of the supply chain moving back to different countries, I think we are actually going to see an increase in demand of AI and robotics that actually equals to automation, right? More automation in the factories where you need uh, less people. You have a pandemic like this happens, you are not gonna get impacted that much if uh, all your factories and supply chains are automated. So yes, you will see some increasing growth of AI and robotics and automation overall. Um, I think also, Non-touch is a very big keyword. You know, Amazon Go has changed the world, how the stores need to look like. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, uh, driverless delivery, autonomous vehicle-based delivery. You know, we have seen some companies like Neuro, um, you know, all over in Silicon Valley, they're delivering with robots and stuff. So you will see a lot of, um, you know, application in the robotics field of AI. AI and robotics will work together and bring in automation for the delivery, for the supply chains, manufacturing and elsewhere. And that's where the area will see a growth within the AI space in 2021. Okay, and just to, to close us off here because this one is perfect for you, Anas. Paul Thurston asks, what is the average check size for Pegasus funds? Now, I know the answer varies, but perhaps you could give us a, a range of what's kind of normal. So I will say that um, uh, on an average, we'll invest like say, I will say three to $5 million in a deal. Uh, our highest check size uh, can be up to $350 million in a, in a company, and it can be as low as 100K for a Y Combinator startup. So pretty much everything from um, a seed round to a SoftBank Vision Fund. Okay. Uh, that's correct. So we have- That's flexibility. Uh, yeah, we have a bunch of funds. Uh, we have 28 funds. If we mix and match, our check size can vary quite a bit. That's what the magic is. Yeah. Uh, guys, we are out of time. Uh, a couple of quick notes before we all go. One, thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, of course, a big thanks to our two panelists, Jim and Anas. Uh, I have been told that there will be a follow-up sent out with Anas's, uh trends write-up and I think also a recording of this event. So if you wanted to listen in to this again, uh, that will be coming out your way. Thank you to everyone who's sending questions. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, a real fun time to be here. And with that, gentlemen, I think we're done. So thank you for coming. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.